Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured. But the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In section 7, in the introduction to Being in Time, Martin Heidegger is going to elaborate for us a at least preliminary conception of what this term phenomenology signifies. And when we hear this, if we, if we aren't used to thinking about this in a rather rigorous way, we are probably going to be a bit misled, in, in part because the word phenomenon already has senses and we, we are accustomed to thinking in terms of other ologies. So he wants to clarify this for us from the beginning. And I should also mention that within this text, phenomenology and ontology, the way that Heidegger is using them and understanding them, really are describing the same ultimate method or activity. So he tells us that um, with the guiding question of the meaning of being, the investigation arrives at the fundamental question of philosophy in general. So what we're dealing with here is not just a branch of philosophy, but you might say an inquiry into the very meaning of what philosophy is doing. So all the other branches would be to some degree uh, illuminated by this. So he says the treatment of this question is phenomenological. And so he says with this term, the treatise dictates for itself neither a standpoint nor a direction because, here's a key point, phenomenology is neither of these and can never be as long as it understands itself. Now, there is an implication there that, of course, phenomenology can be turned into something that actually doesn't understand itself. It can be appropriated, it can be reduced, it can be turned into something that is no longer true to its own origins and spirit. So he says, the expression phenomenology signifies primarily a concept of what? Of a method, of an approach, of a fundamental way of going about things. So he says it does not characterize the what of the objects of philosophical research in terms of their content, but the how of the, this research. And, and Heidegger is going to make this point at several times, the distinction between the what and the how. So what does he tell us then about this whole business of phenomenology? That's uh, very nice in terms of pre preliminary uh, per, you know, ambulations around the, the concept, but what is phenomenology then. So he's going to first examine the concept of phenomenon, and we've given that a discussion already, and then the concept of logos, the ology. And then uh, there's a final section where he comes to the preliminary concept of phenomenology. So he says, when we bring to mind concretely what we have he exhibited for ourselves in uh, phenomenon and logos, we're struck by an interrelation between what is meant by those terms. What, what is uh, the, the content? What is the core of phenomena, phenomenon, right? Phenomena is the Greek. And then logos, or the ology for us. He says, the expression phenomenology could be formulated in Greek as Legain, that's the infinitive of the verb that Logos is coming from, ta phenomena. Then he says, but Legain, as we've discovered, means apophonistai. And that means to reveal, to bring to presence, to 
show forth for the, the, those who are looking for things. And this is done through speech, right? So he says, to let what shows itself be seen from itself, not just to be shown in light of something else, but to be shown from itself, what it is, how it is, what kind of thing it is also in its relations to other things. So he says, that's the formal meaning of the type of research that calls itself phenomenology. And that's where we get this maxim, this famous saying, uh, back to the things themselves, right? So what are the things themselves and how do we go to the things themselves? Heidegger, by the way, he will say this at several points here, wants to caution us against thinking that this is some sort of naive, uh, just look around and you've got the things themselves right in front of you. It may actually take quite a lot of work to get the things to reveal themselves as they are in themselves. But there's a fundamental optimism here about the possibility of grasping what things are. Now, the next thing that he talks about in this section is being covered up. Why does he talk about that? This has to do in part with Heidegger's conception of truth as aletheia, uncovering or discovering or bringing out of forgetfulness or concealment. And it also has to do with the activity that the phenomenologist is engaged in. So he says, um, what is it that phenomenology is to let be seen? He says, um, manifestedly, it's something that does not show itself initially. And for the most part, something that is concealed. Otherwise you wouldn't need to go about looking for it. Would you, if it was entirely there on the surface, you wouldn't need a method. So this is a method that applies to things that are in some respect concealed, or he's going to say here covered up. And he says, what remains concealed in an exceptional sense or what falls back and is covered up again or shows itself only in a distorted way is not this or that being, but rather the being of beings. Now, is this the being of beings in the sense of, you know, sort of capital B, the totality uh, that, that runs through everything? No, no, he's not talking about that. But he is talking about the being of beings, how something really is in itself. So he tells us phenomenology is a way of access to and the demonstrative manner of determination of what is to become the theme of ontology. And so he says the phenomenolo phenomenological concept of phenomenon self-showing means the being of beings. This, this self-showing is nothing arbitrary, nor is it something like an appearing. Uh, the being of beings is least of all something behind which something else stands. He says nothing stands behind the phenomena of phenomenology. Rather, being covered up is where we have to look. And he says there's different ways in which phenomena can be covered up. And here we have something like a typology that he's setting out. It's really got two different dimensions to it. He talks about what is undiscovered, what is at, at some point in time not yet discovered by anybody. Nobody even has an inkling that it's there quite often. He says, um, there is neither knowledge nor lack of knowledge about it. As soon as we have a lack of knowledge that we're aware of as a lack of knowledge, now we actually have something that we can begin to discover. The second thing that he talks about is buried over. Now, what does he mean by that? He says, a phenomenon can be discovered, but then got covered up again. The third thing that he talks about um, is distortion. And he says it's the most frequent and most dangerous kind because here the possibilities of being deceived and being misled are particularly pertinacious. And he talks about the tendency for us to see things within a system that ends up distorting what it is that the system is supposed to be applying to. And you can think of so many different systems and examples. 
Heidegger doesn't give you examples here, but I think it would be worthwhile for us to dwell on a few of these. I'm going to use something that Heidegger very infrequently talks about, and that is romantic love. Now, as a child, you can certainly read fairy tales, and of, of course, you can be exposed to all sorts of influences that can uh, you know, make you sort of precociously involved in that. But for, for many children, that's something that is in the realm of the undiscovered until suddenly they do discover it. Then it can be buried over. Think of if you're old or even middle-aged, what your first crush was like, what that experience was like for you. You might have to do a lot of work to try to recover that because you've done so much living and experiencing and, and rethinking the stuff that's involved in your life since that time. I know I certainly would. Um, I can cognitively bring it to, to mind right away, but I would have to actually do a lot of work to recapture the affectivity of it. It's buried over, right? Distortion. It's Valentine's Day. You know you're supposed to be doing something with your significant other on Valentine's Day because that's what everybody does. Now, this is a great example of something else that Heidegger calls the you know, average everydayness as well, but that's a different concept. Maybe romantic love as whatever it happens to be, whatever kind of being or beings it is, is thereby distorted by being placed in that perspective. Hopefully those examples give you some idea of what he's talking about here. Now he tells us they, they have a different uh, set of modalities as well. They can be accidental or they can be necessary. So he says there are accidental coverings, necessary ones, the latter grounded in the enduring nature of the discovered. And here he gives us a caution. He says it's possible for every phenomenological concept and proposition drawn from genuine origins to degenerate when communicated in a statement. We have to be very careful not to lose sight of what is being provided to us in phenomenology or through phenomenology or by phenomenology, not to simply take it for granted as if it's some sort of commodity that we can put in our pocket or a set of data that we can say put on a multiple choice test of some sort. If we do that, we're actually losing it and covering up is taking place. The next thing that he talks about that's useful for understanding what phenomenology is, is this distinction between phenomenal and phenomenological. And he says, now we can actually give these fixed meanings. He says, what is given and explicable in the way we encounter the phenomenon is called phenomenal. What is given, what, what we encounter, right? And is explicable in the way we encounter the phenomenon, that's the phenomenal. We, we encounter this constantly. You are engaging in it right now and so am I. So what is the phenomenal logical then? It's similar to his distinction between ontic and ontological or existential and existential. He says that the, uh, everything that belongs to the manner of indication and explication and constitutes the conceptual tools this research requires, that is what we call phenomenological. So he says, phenomenon in the phenomenological understanding is always just what constitutes being. So where can we go from here? Here's where he begins to talk again about ontology. And he brings in another term that is particularly important. Ontology is what we're doing in doing Heideggerian phenomenology. We're also engaged in what he's going to call here hermeneutics. That's a rather fancy term for uh, something that we're a bit more uh, familiar with as interpretation. And interpretation is when we get something and we call some meaning of it, out of it, or we place it within a framework, or we make sense of it, or we question it so that we can better understand it. 
And there's, there's always some sort of back and forth and there's always some contribution on our own side. Many people are very afraid of interpretations because they think that, oh, if I ever engage in interpretation, I will not have objectivity and objectivity is the, you know, uh, sine qua non of anything being scientific. It really depends on what we're actually studying. The human areas of study require interpretation. And so Heidegger tells us that hermeneutics is essential. Hermeneutics is not just a discipline. It's the way that Dasein exists in relation to itself, in relation to its world, in relation to others. So he says phenomenology of Dasein is hermeneutics in the original signification of that word, which designates the work of interpretation. And then he says, since discovery of the meaning of being and the basic structures of Dasein in general exhibits the horizon for every further ontological research into beings unlike Dasein, that is, since this inquiry of fundamental ontology indicates something that structures other regional ontologies, which is what we call the sciences and disciplines, right? He says the present hermeneutic, the one he's developing, is at the same time hermeneutics in the sense that it works out the condition of the possibility of every ontological investigation. He's using what we call there transcendental language. And a little bit uh, just after that, he's going to talk about the transcendentality of the inquiry he's engaged in. He brings up a third point about hermeneutics, saying Since Dasein has an ontological priority over all other beings, as a being in the possibility of existence, hermeneutics is the analysis of what he's going to call the existentiality of existence. Now, you might hear that and say, this sounds very circular, the existentiality of existence. What does he mean there? Remember that the existential has to do with not just what exists, but the framework, the structures of existence, including our relation to it. Existence is for us as Dasein, as human beings. So the existentiality of existence means its fundamental structures as what is for us not just what exists in a bare sense. So he goes on, he says a few other things that are of interest here. I mentioned the the transcendentiality. He says the transcendence of the being of Dasein uh, is a a distinctive one. In it lies the possibility and necessity of the most radical individuation. We as human beings are capable of greater individuation than other beings are. Then he says, Every disclosure of being as the transcendence, that which transcends, is transcendental knowledge. So phenomenological truth is transcendental truth. So he tells us here, to bring it to a close, ontology and phenomenology are not two different disciplines, which among others belong to philosophy. Both of these actually characterize what is at the very core often misunderstood of genuine philosophy from its beginnings all the way up to the present. And we also have this third term in there as well that's vitally important of hermeneutics. So we've got phenomenology, ontology, and hermeneutics all as ways of describing this approach that Heidegger is taking in Being and Time. 